Hey everyone, Walter Crosby with uh, Helix Sales Development and your host of Sales and Cigars. Today we have a, a, a fun episode with uh, Brent Keltner. Uh, his company is Winalytics and Brent's got a interesting background. He comes from academia and doing research and he's able to apply some of those recognition of patterns and applying that to, to sales. He had a successful sales career and he started his consultancy. Um, so we have a conversation about how, how culture works, the things that CEOs really should be focused on to help that sales organization create the stories, right? And I'm, I'm a firm believer that salespeople need great stories. They need to understand their own story to be able to position the company well. well. Talk a little bit about how positioning, uh, using the right words is important and what those, and we should be focused on the outcomes of our customers and our customers' customers, not on us, right? And this is something we talk about a lot on the program um, and Brent just uh, validates it in a different way. So go grab a cigar, grab a cocktail, strap in for another fun episode of Sales and Cigars. Thanks. So, Brent, welcome to the podcast. We really appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to have a conversation. Yeah, Walter, thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Great. Um, so I, I had a, a couple of questions. We'll talk about the business a little bit, um, kind of in the spa- same space, but we have different different approaches. So I want to learn a little bit about that. But I'd like to, I'd like to ask, when I get somebody who's, running a company in the training development space, revenue space, what what do you see being the the biggest concerns that CEOs have or what do you see that they're missing when it when they look at their sales? What's the disconnect with the sales organization? I the number one problem, I think uh, the number one thing CEOs are not paying attention to that they should be paying attention to is the buyer and customer journey. Okay. CEOs have to own that. And the reason they have to own it is twofold is the world has gotten much more complex, right? In terms of the expectation for personalization, Yep. every buyer wants you to talk to them, their role, their goals, their segment. CEO has to own that. They have to own the brand promise. The second thing is our revenue organizations have gotten a lot more complex, once upon a day, once upon a time, there was sales and customer service probably 10 years ago, right? There yeah, was not sales. that long ago. Yeah, not that not long ago. Not that long ago. Now you got, uh, you got your demand gen organization, you got your prospectors, you got your sales team, account management team, customer success team, your rev ops team. They all have to be connected to create a, a seamless buyer and customer journey. They're often disconnected in ways that causes all kinds of friction, for the buyer, because those t- those teams aren't working well together. They all have their own leaders, multiple reporting lines. The CEO has got to own the fact that you need an integrated go go to market experience. And and they is it fair to say that sometimes they assume the revenue officer, the the chief sales person, whatever their title is, because those have gotten a lot more creative than they were ten years ago. Um, is it, is it they're assuming that this person has everything under control? Um, is it that they don't feel comfortable delving into that? What, what are your thoughts around around that? I think it's both of those. I mean, look, good CEOs are good at hiring talent. Mm -hmm. And so they want to hire talent and enable talent. Um, so that's part of it. I'm just like, I'm going to delegate. And then part of it is, you know, if you haven't grown up as a, in sales, right, you kind of feel like, well, I can't show up to those meetings and add value uh, as the CEO, so I'm not going to show up to those meetings. But it, what it really doesn't help the culture, doesn't help the mission, doesn't help the brand, doesn't help the story, right? If they're not, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, I love to tell the story. Um, th- there's a company called ETU, which does immersive virtual reality, uh, and they do a best practice a virtual immersive virtual reality for soft skill training, right? Oh, Different leadership or diversity and inclusion or what is based in Dublin. 
Uh, they do what I think is a best practice. And there's some others that we've worked with. TrueFit uh, has a retail personalization platform and others. They have these cross go-to-market meetings that are really just to di- dive into different elements of the buyer and customer journey. Sometimes maybe on the success motion or the land and expand or what are we hearing in our, our, our first calls? Diving into it just to line the team up on where are we winning in our messaging. The CEO at ETU shows up on those calls. Wow. And he's just saying, this is important, guys and gals. I'm here well, because if, this motion is really important. If nothing else, that's the message. That yeah. the CEO, he or she's showing up, interested, whether they engage at a high level or they, or they ask questions. It, it's sending a message to the team that we, you know, need to work well in the sandbox together and not kick sand in each other's faces. Um, that's right. And I, and I think that's a, um, that's a, that's an interesting observation that um, when I ask that question to CEOs, they, they, I get, you know, they're worried about forecast. They're worried about what's coming out of the output from the revenue. Um, and they don't really understand how their forecast is created. That's an interesting perspective. And it kind of goes into another another thought I had around sales culture. And uh, uh, let me set it up this way. I, I've, sales culture is part of, of the company culture in, in the way I look at it. But I think salespeople are different. So we we should have a little bit louder kind of meeting we should there should be some energy in there we should have a lot more competitiveness amongst the team and i equate it to uh, an italian family's sunday dinner right where it's loud there's everybody shouting sometimes there's food being tossed but there's this love and trust there and and nobody's going to break into that like they can talk to each other in a certain way but nobody from the outside can come in and start picking on another salesperson. But there's that, that competitiveness for the team to be successful. Um, so in the CEO can definitely play a part in that. Um, but what I, what I see a problem at, I'd, I'd love your take on this is that they come out, a, a CEO or leadership will come out and talk about, these are the things that we're going to do. We're going to build customer service. We're going to, really focus on the customer's journey and make sure that that we're giving them what they need and providing great service. But then they fail to go and connect the dots for the individuals. Like, what do I need to do as the guy on the shipping dock to really make a difference? What do I need to do in, a, a, as a salesperson, right? What are, what are the things that I should do that I can have a great effect and, and even uh, finance and accounting, what, how does that work? And if we don't tell people what, what they can do, they sort of just look at it as this nebulous thing. And, yeah, that sounds great, but they don't know what to do. Is it, how does that, how does that well, well, two Two parts of what you said really land. One is, um, look, sales is different. We I, And there's a chapter in our book, and I wrote a, um article on this in Customer Think on, you know, three revenue cultures, one revenue team, right? Whereas, you know, sales and sales I describe as action-oriented, you know, focused on putting numbers on the board and story-driven. Mm-hmm. You know, the marketing folks are more analytical and they speak in flowery language, which is evocative and important, yeah. right? Yeah. And the success people are sort of more nurturers and customer first and how do we – Make it so different cultures, and there is a little bit more rambunctiousness to the sales culture, without That's a, good a doubt. Word. I like that word. That's good. Rambunctious. Um, and and so and they, it should be right. It should be. There's no. We we want to compete and we want to win. A lot of ex athletes are just competitive people, right? In whatever sphere. Um, so I think you have to uh, do that. You have to build the cross team mechanisms, and one of the greatest ways to build the cross team mechanisms is honestly just sharing stories across those teams. It's a leveler. And this is where I think CEOs honestly can provide the most value. In addition to saying, I'm here, is just telling their stories about work with customers. 
yep. or customer calls they were on or customer, how they describe the customer experience to the investors or, you know, which ones they hone in on. Because at the end of the day, your CEO is the ultimate arbiter of your positioning. <laughs> Well, Uh at the end of the day, I mean, some people think it's marketing. Some people think it's the advertising. But the CEO is one that's responsible for everything. At the end of the day, they got all of it. And you're you're right. If they can get the the leaders of all of those groups together and 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 have a have a conversation where they just share what there's what's being heard, that sort of cross pollination of ideas and information and data sometimes and intelligence of what's going on can really have those like aha moments for the the people that are opposing ideas that they can like, oh, I didn't realize that that's what's going on in the field. Maybe we should rethink what we're doing. Right. And it's just it's communication, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I. So what you said, this kind of cross fertilization, 100 percent, Walter, I think the other thing I would just look, CEOs have to be good storytellers because they have to sell investors and they have to sell stake, you know, shareholders or wherever it is. And the media, the media and using that skill to actually motivate your team like, okay, this is an abstract kind of this is what it means better. You know, client services, right, is well, tell a story around it because that's where the rubber hits the road. And this is how. You know, example of a customer we won back because of the adjustments we're planning on client services. Uh, so they should just use the stories as a way of making it both more energizing, uh, but also much more practical and specific for their team on what a direction means. Yeah, it, it, to me, it's always about that that level of communication. And if the leader can, they should be great at telling stories, like you said. Um, and, and communicating ideas through stories um, and making sure that the vision that they have and the strategies that they've sort of identified are, are, are understood and, and being carried, carried out so that the customer walks away with that, that feeling. I had a, a conversation with a gentleman the other day. Um, he made me think about um, if you're – is he had a CEO talking about, you know, we should be talking to our customers about their problems and about their solutions and the outcomes we can support them with, right? Nobody cares about our features and benefits, right? That's a always a challenge with some salespeople. But this CEO has started to have the conversation of what do we know about our customers' customers? Hmm. Does our customer, do we understand what's important for them to deliver? Can we provide any value in how that works? And the story he told was interesting. It was around a non-for-profit. So think about a, like a, a cancer researcher that has to go out and do these networking events and fundraise. He's selling, right? But he's a, a scientist, super smart person, and he can't go out and talk about the biology and the molecular biology and all of the the research, the technical research that he's doing, he's got to go out and talk about what they're doing for the kids, what they're doing for the women, the patients, right? What, what, what they're delivering and help that donor understand that you're helping the community, you're helping this part of the community, and it's not so much about what we do. It just to me, it was like it was one more level in that – can that kind of story can be really powerful in turn in, inside your organization to really make them think about it's not just our customer, it's the customer's customer. And then it goes to the community after that. It's huge. What, what yeah, yeah, 100%. What is doing? our customer being held accountable for and to whom? And what are they trying, what are they trying to do? And can, because if we can add value as a, as a sales organization to our customers, that far down the line, we're we're obviously ingrained. We're obviously helping them. Uh, we really understand, and they see us as a partner rather than a vendor. Um, yep. And I think that's a that's a big goal for a for a sales organization. Um, and and it's just to me, it's like that's a it's a great way to think about. Uh, you know, a non for profit really has to has to do that. And if we could do that in a 
traditional B2B role, um, how, how much impact we could really have as a. Yeah, hundred percent. So it's well put. So, um, let's talk a little bit about you and, and the company and you've got a, got an interesting background, um, that doesn't necessarily draw a straight line to sales. Um, Mm -hmm. and I like to talk about what your, you know, your, ideal client profile is and, and, and how you can really help them. Cause our, our audience is wide. we got CEOs, we got sales leaders, we got reps out there, um, these entrepreneurs. So um, kind of like help understand what kind of resources you can bring to the party. Yeah. Great. I mean, we, we talk about what we do is go to market and revenue acceleration consulting because our focus, I mean, uh, is really creating that integrated buyer and customer journey and positioning value across the entire, uh, across the entire buyer and customer journey. And so we uh, work with teams. I mean, we have a series of playbooks, uh, including kind of demand gen and how do you build out your website with the right content. So content strategy playbooks, prospecting playbooks, sales playbooks, customer success playbooks. And it's all about uh, building value alignment. But then for us, what a playbook means it's a how-to guide with examples for how do you shift from your product to your buyer value. And our whole thing is it's not about you. It's not about your product. It's not about your successes. It's about why your buyer or customer showed up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and showing them how you can help them to a more successful future and having plays that in every interaction remind us to go from our product how to our buyer or customer why uh, drives revenue. We, we were talking about the outcomes that that the company can provide to the customer, and that's always the context that we should be talking about. Nobody cares about how how long the company's been around, how many logos we have. They really care about what are you going to be able to to do. And that's that's a, right. I mean, do you, do you help them drive revenue because you capture more? customers from the website, right? You convert more buyers to browsers, or do you have a, you know, tool that helps with retention, right? Do you keep more of your students or you keep more of your workforce? Or are you optimizing a lot of the industrial automation companies we work with? They're optimizing productivity in a manufacturing plant. So you can do more with less spend or extending our staff reach, right? So either asset or staff utilization, you could change a user experience, right? You can lead to higher, quicker time to insights. What are those, we call them value plays, but what are those outcomes we drive for their, our buyer that get them excited to talk to us? Not the products and features, but what outcome do the products and features create to build value for your buyer? And explaining that in the context of, uh, of, of the buyer, of your customer, as to how this is really going to help them save time, uh, mitigate risk, and either save or make money, right? That's Those are the, the big motivators. The, the, those are the big things. And at the end of the day, we'll go back to stories. It's all in your current customer stories. If you don't know the answer to those questions, go ask your best customers why they bought from you and why they're still buying from you. What was different after that they didn't have before and just start to write that down because that that's gold, right? Your best customers that have been with you the longest, done the most business with you, the reasons they are with you, the outcomes that you've helped them achieve, that's what you want to capture and sell forward. It's how you differentiate. It's it's how you talk about those, the, the outcomes that they're really concerned about. And to a large extent, especially early in a conversation they don't care how the sausage is made they -hmm. just want to know that the sausage is is going to taste good and it's 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 you know safe right especially if it's sausage um but i mean that to me that's the that's the thing that i see so many companies they they can't tell their own story yeah Um, the sales guys just can't do it and i i think that i think that is in a large part the CEOs, the leadership's um, responsibility to tee that up, make sure that's available, keep adding to it, and and then give that to the to the salespeople. And if we have competent competencies and they have skills, 
they should be able to take those stories and that messaging and positioning, take it to market. And if they're saying the right things and they're talking to the right people, we increase our chances of closing business. Yeah. And expanding business. Yeah. Wider right. and deeper. Yeah. Wall yeah. And, and, and you're absolutely, we're hundred percent aligned. Um, the CEO ultimately has to own that and can model it by not just the high level initiatives, but Hey, let me tell a story about how that could translate for one of our customers and building that habit of saying, Hey, this is about what we're helping our customers achieve or their customers achieve. It's not about our product is such a critical mindset shift. There is a, you know, two industry stats, and I can't remember which is from Gartner and which is from Forrester, but one says, you know, uh, 80% of salespeople think they need to share all of their product information to have a complete conversation. And 75% of buyers only want to have conversations with sales and marketing teams that understand their specific business issues and their specific business challenges. So we want a product dump and they want personalization to their business situation. And it, it's literally ass backwards. Um, and what, what salespeople, sales organizations don't realize is we, the basic questions that were needed, like think of a car dealership and even just in the seventies and eighties, you needed the, the salesman in the dealership to tell you about the car, the engine, whatever the, how many cup holders there were, whatever was important to you, they held the keys to the information. And the buyers today are so much more informed and so much farther down that, that journey, as you said before, and getting that alignment so we, we, we meet them in the right spot, ask the right questions to give ourselves credibility and to really dig into what their real, their real challenges are and we can figure that out, and we should be able to figure out if we can help them. Yeah, hundred percent. And if and that's what sales is about is is it's not so much putting a product in somebody; it's about trying to help them solve a problem or find a problem that they didn't realize they had, and and solving that for them. Um, yep. It's to me, it's just helping, and you you got to believe that you're doing that to start. Yeah, when it's done well, it is a service profession, right? Our goal is to make our buyers and customers more successful. That's and point it, one, two, one, two, and three. And if we um, don't, we don't approach it like that, we, we sound like the proverbial, you know, clip on tie, short sleeve shirt guy with the, you know, in the used car lot. And that it's just a, it's a terrible moniker that we we have to deal with, but it's our job to elevate. Yep. It's a good and word to elevate. I like it. Uh, You asked how I, you know, my background, I'm a PhD social scientist. I spent 10 years doing qualitative research and uh, there's two parts. Some pretty big, for some pretty big institutions. Yeah. At Stanford and Rand, that was, um, you know, where I began my professional career. And, you know, at the end of the day, I loved research because I love pattern recognition, but I just couldn't, you know, I, I didn't like the financial trajectory. And so I went to did what academics call going to the dark side. (laughs) And I went to work with Kaplan and their higher education group, um, you know, leveraging the academic background to be uh, in one of their divisions, selling adult degree programs. Um, And, you know, I then had a series of revenue leadership roles four pretty quick successes and then started Winalytics as a consultancy. And I think the reason I arrived doing what I, I do is I was a math uh, history guy in college. And so math I love both the stories, math and history. Okay. I love and both the stories and I love the kind of simple analytics that come in math. And at the end of the day, good go-to-market strategy is just telling stories about value after pattern recognizing. So that process of iteration you described, I mean, it's just recognizing buyer by type, what are they leaning into? And then rinse and repeat a story about value. So I was good at storytelling and I was good at pattern recognition. Um, And that's what go-to-market strategy is. We have to tell the right stories to the right buyers and be able to version that and figure out by role and by, you know, use case and by segment, what matters most to them. 
So when, when, what, who's your, who's your ideal client? What's the right persona? Like what size organization does, like, who's a good target? Cause if we got people out here listening and, and you said, you said a, a bunch of things that, that might resonate with somebody, um, we'll have all the, your contact information in the show notes, but I mean, who's the person that you really like, that's my that's my guy or my gal I can help. Yeah, I would say there there's two um, growth companies in kind of the three to twenty million dollar range um, that are really trying to optimize revenue by building out a better go to market experience. And often we're working there with CEOs, CMOs, and the sales leader. Together, those kind of you know some of those people pick up quicker, but it's you know, the idea that we need to get better value alignment to grow quicker. Uh, we need to personalize value. Okay. The other one, we do do enterprise work, and usually it's a chief sales officer that is sponsoring us there. And usually in an enterprise situation, the connection between sales and marketing is, like, not very agile. And so the you're chief being, sales officer, kind. what's that? Said so you're being kind. <laughs> I'm being kind. So the chief sales officers that say, hey, I need a partner on positioning to make my sales positioning a lot better uh, are the ones that kind of lean in. Um, so we think of our secret sauce as making a unique market position sales executable. So you give them the words and help them tell the stories in a repeatable fashion. Exactly. And, and then and build, the, build team skills to do that. And those are the things that like when you're coaching somebody and there's, there's a challenge or not, not their win rate is not where it should be, or they're not having success moving things through. Those are what you look at. What are you saying? How are you saying it? And are you saying it to the right people at the right time? Um, and, and, and that's what you help them. And, and the positioning piece is critical. If we don't yeah, get sales rate. positioning is a under recognized need, right? We teach all the tactical managing the sales process, but usually the deficit when you don't have good pipeline velocity is you haven't landed on value. Yep. You haven't got the buyer to confirm something they care enough about to motivate, you know, their team internally and spend money. And we often say, look, buying is unnatural. Because I'm going to have to, do, as a buyer, I'm going to have to do something different, and I'm going to pay for the privilege of doing that. And, and usually pay more than the status quo. And pay more than the status quo. So that means to get some, motivate somebody to do that, to pay more, right, to do something different and bring their team along, you got to really anchor on something they value a lot. Something we talk about a buyer's success statement is, if they were to tell you in six months you're working together, what, what's that more successful future for them? Mm -hmm. What would they say? What would and, make and, them a hero to their boss? Like, what's the more successful future that's going to motivate them to put in the work now to get through the sales process with you? So if you've got a room of sales professionals um, and you're asked that question, you get a bunch of blank stares back, right? Where they're, they're not really sure how to answer that question. They yeah, did, they never... often they're they're not, and we'll say this very simple audit technique, and I'll give you two, is look at your follow-up email, and how many times do you recap what your buyer said about value? Hmm. Right? The typical follow-up email, you've seen it as, hey, thanks for the time today. Right. Brr, here's, here's all the products we talked about. Just two sentences on, let's go back to your the industrial automation example. You know, you shared that Parsable is a client we've worked with. Um, you know, you saw how automating some of your standard operating maintenance procedures could help your team resolve more maintenance problems without having to go to the shop floor. Something as simple as that. You said the product would provide you this, this kind of value. Great. Now talk about the elements of the product that help, but always start with what's what's their why for the next conversation. Because it, it, it's it's it, rarely yeah. to just get on and see a deeper demo. It's there's right. something they're trying to solve. It, we have to demonstrate that we've listened, 
and that we've paid attention to those real problems and that and that there's a pathway to keep talking right yep we don't differentiate and and i part of what you were saying i call urgency if we don't create that urgency that this is a priority this is something that you know if something doesn't get corrected there's bad things that might happen whatever that means um so that's a um and those are things that salespeople struggle to figure out on their own. And frankly, you know, their job is to tell the story that maybe somebody else crafted and put it. It's sheet music that they play with their voice. Right. I mean, they just they're playing their instrument. And, you know, Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie can play the same notes and you'll know who's playing what because, you know, they sound wildly different. So we have to give them the, the music to play and and. Let, and make sure that they're delivering it to the right people. Uh, I, I, I think the, you're, you're right about that. It's better when it's uh, there's, you know, uh, sales enablement or revenue enablement or marketing is building out some of these content. But I don't want to let salespeople off the hook here. I, I tell I will tell a story about, um, you know, a sales individual. Samir Hussani, who was, um, you know, he was an industrial, he's trained as an industrial engineer, went into sales account management to make more money. He was a uh, son of Egyptian immigrants, right? He wanted to do well and he wasn't doing that well. And uh, he was doing okay. And I remember just saying to him about having more, we call them authentic conversations. Um, you know, so one day he showed up for a plant that had a pump they needed for a cooling system. Normally, after that, he would just go through his talk about more pumps and more valves and more filters and more control systems because his manager always said, don't miss a product opportunity. And this time he just we coached him to just say, hey, what else are you working on? Mm. Great and the, the plant manager was like started calling him my success partner. And he spent 40 minutes talking about how that plant connected that pump connected to three business problems he was being held accountable for, you know, wow. plan maintenance, you know, product line uptimes and, and one other. Um, and so he, and he, he would get in the habit of, Hey, what else are you working on? And what else could we work on together that would make you more successful? Great Why are question. you here today? So it doesn't, I mean, customer stories hard to generate on your own, but just simple questioning techniques. And then, you know, as people would answer his question, they'd say, oh, well, I'm working on this. He'd say, so tell me more. What have you tried around that? What's working and what's not working? Have, has a goal been set against that? What kind of improvement? So these simple things just to get simple non-technical questions to get our buyers to tell us what gets them really excited. Because here, Walter, is the difference. When we talk about our product, do you know what that sounds like to our buyers? Sort of like the Peanuts uh, cartoons, right? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> when you have in an email a sentence that says, I heard you say this is what you're working on, do you know what that sounds like to our buyers? You listen to me. Hallelujah. Yeah, because you are one of eight salespeople that actually listened to me and took the time to listen, ask good questions, actively listen and share back what we might work together. And oh. it, it's simply like being curious as yeah. a salesperson, right? To be like, why do you do it that way? Hmm. OK. And then, is that working? No, it's not working. Oh, then why? Why do you keep doing it that way? Right? It, it's, it's, it's almost like having a conversation with a friend who's got a problem and they've called you and said they need some advice, but you just, you're curious about why they're doing things and, and what else is happening, what might be causing that. If you just bring that basic curiosity and the ability to keep your mouth shut and ask a question. Yep. Um, it's so much, it's so much more fun, frankly. Yep. And um, he, here's the, uh, here's the thing I would say to your sales or sales leaders that are listening and your CEOs who are listening is, Give your, and this is going to sound a little strange, but I'll explain it. Give your sales team permission to be curious mm. yeah. because we had a decade of training, right? It kicked off within lots of reasons, but, you know, so 2010s was a decade of so-called major innovation and sales innovation and strategy, right? Up mm -hmm. until 2011, we had seven major methodologies, 
took 60 years to develop. And then from 2011 to 2019, starting with Challenger, boom, explosion. Got tw- had 20 by the end of it. But all of them were focused on the buyer, I mean, the seller, mm-hmm. the seller's action, the seller's process, the seller being in control of the sale, teach, tailor, take control, command of the sale. That's what they all focused on. Yep. So what sellers have learned is I got to drive this. I'm in charge. I need to have a closed plan. I need to position all the elements of my product. You need to say, forget all that. That's not helping you. Performance dropped radically during this so-called period of innovation. What you need to do is ask three or four simple questions in every interaction about why your buyer is talking to them and what's not working for them. That's your mission number one, two, and three. Get to a buyer or customer success statement. And then be able to, to ask those questions and then follow up and dig in and make sure that you're really understanding and what that's really causing, which helps the, the, the customer or the prospect, you know, realize that this is a bigger issue and that they do need to fix it. Um, and that there might, that you, you know, as a salesperson might have the solution. That's some really insightful. Um, and, you know, I'm going to take back what I said, you know, your, your background's interesting, but, there, it, there is a dot that those dots connect because you really saw what yeah. seeing those patterns happening and, and being able to, you know, salespeople are pretty good at adding things up when there's a dollar sign in front of them, but um, or a percentage. <laughs> but about. Regular math is uh, kind of uh, can elude us from time to time, but especially mm-hmm. when it's on a commission check, they're pretty tight with the math. So mm-hmm. I like the, I like the land of the question I usually ask, uh, if, if you have any relationship with cigars, as the podcast is called, Sales and Cigars. Yeah, look, I've always loved cigars. I don't smoke them very often. Uh, I've always landed cigars, but I will share a not well-known fact about me. Uh, you know who Branch Rickey is? Yep. Yeah, so he was my great-grandfather. Oh, really? Yeah, so my probably strongest association with cigars is pictures of him chomping on a cigar. And there's uh, there's a few of those. Um, yeah, there's quite a few of those because, as you may know, his backstory. I mean, he was a uh, what at the time they called the fundamentalist, you know, Christian. He was a very committed person of faith, and he sort of promised his mother. I mean, he didn't have any sort of bad habits, so to speak. Is a little bit boring in that way. He didn't ever go to the park on Sunday, so cigar smoking was his bad habit because everybody's got to have one. Hmm. Interesting. That's a, that's an interesting tidbit. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Great story. So um, we'll have some, um, we'll have your contact info and, and things in the show notes, your website, LinkedIn. What's the best way of all of those things? What's the best way for somebody to reach out to you if they're uh, interested in having a further conversation? Yeah, I mean, they're welcome to uh, reach out on LinkedIn. A lot of people have done that after shows and then, you know, We can dialogue and happy to go to an email conversation if there's something deeper people want to explore. So reach out to me on LinkedIn is great. Uh, The other thing I would just encourage people to do, if you go to the website, Authenticity Wins, it actually goes to our book website, which is part of our main website. They can download for free uh, the first two chapters of our book uh, and might get some insights or thoughts from that. Awesome. That's a great little tidbit. Um, All right, great. Uh, Again, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time out, some really thoughtful uh, ideas and answers. So appreciate it. Yeah, Walter, really enjoyed the conversation. Great set of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you for listening to Sales and Cigars with Walter Crosby of Helix Sales Development. For more on Sales and Cigars, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Sales and Cigars, produced by thepodcastproshop.com.